All right, now that we have the basic stuff installed, let's get our Django project started and talk about some of the things that you're going to need to think about before you get into any heavy lifting. I'll show you what I mean here in a second. So let's go into PyCharm, create a new project, choose Django on the left, name it something that makes sense. I'm going to call it Weather App. And I'm not going to choose our base Python install. Remember we created a virtual environment? Well, this is where this comes into play. So I'm going to click on the gear, add local, and I'm going to point it to our users, our name, our environments, our app itself, or our environment that we created, our scripts folder, and that Python. And that's the one that I want to use. I want to use the virtual environment Python, not our base install. And this will allow PyCharm to detect when we have missing packages when things are not going to work, it'll it'll warn us, okay? And it'll also, if it, if we want to, uh, excuse me, uh, PyCharm is smart enough to know if something's missing, and it might ask if you want to install it. Well, you want to make sure it installs it to the right place. So point it here to your virtual environment first. Then click on More Settings. Give your application a name. I'm going to call it Station. This is a weather station. So Weather App is our project name. That's like the folder that it's all in and station is our application name. So once we're done, click create, and it's gonna create all kinds of files, all kinds of stuff. So let's see what we got here. Oh yeah, all kinds of stuff. So we're gonna go over what these do in a minute. But first things first, actually let's test this. Let's just go in and let's see. Okay, yeah, it needed a second to, to get everything ready. So we're going to hit run, and there you go. So we can click on the server. It creates a local uh, server. It's just like a basic lightweight web server that you don't use for, for production, but you, it's good to be able to check your Django app on your local computer and make sure that it's working. So it is. So you should see this. Congratulations. If not, you broke something early on and you need to go Google how to fix your Django install. So now that we know that it's working, you can see it's created like a little basic database, which we're not going to use and that's fine. So let's stop this and let's get real for a second and talk about what your structure of your app should look like. Now, a lot of people don't talk, I've, no one ever talks about this, but it's really, really important because you're going to get in here you're going to go into your Django app and you're going to program all kinds of great things for it to do. Fetch data from an API, maybe write it to a database, uh, convert some stuff over, whatever it is that you do, and you deploy your app and everything's beautiful. And then you realize that it blows up when it gets a lot of visitors. And I want to talk about what would cause that to happen. So to illustrate, I'm going to use this fancy Microsoft Paint. And this is representing your web page. This is your browser. And this is sort of how I want you, want you to look at this. This is the API. And this is where all the data for our web page comes from. We're doing a weather station. We're going to go to uh, Weather Underground API. It could be Twitter. It could be whatever you're using. And imagine, if you will, Every time someone hits your API, or excuse me, every time someone visits your page, it fetches data from the API, it returns it, and then Django helps render that into HTML, which is displayed on your web page, and boom, there's all your information. Everything works great. Well, think about what happens when someone loads the page. In order for the information to be displayed correctly, you have to successfully hit the API. The API has to return the data and then it has to be converted over into the web page. So that can take some time. Now, if the internet connection is fast and the API is fast, it might not be a huge lag. But what if the API is down? 
or it's overloaded or it's slow to respond. That can cause your web page to display very slowly or not at all. And it can create some scenarios where the user experience isn't really all that great. So what we want to do is separate the API calls from the actual page load so that if the API is acting up, it's not going to cause a problem with loading our page. Also, think about how many times you're allowed to call the API per day. What if you have, say, a 10,000 uh, call limit in a day or a 1,000 call limit in a day if it's a really strict API? Think of how many visitors you might be getting. If you're calling the API to get fresh data every time the person reloads the page, if a person reloads it five or six times, keeps checking the updated weather, well, you're burning up an API call every time. And if you have thousands of visitors, you're going to hit your daily quota or your hourly quota pretty much right off the bat. And for the rest of the day, your page isn't updating anymore. And that's a problem. So again, we need to separate the API calls from the page load and the page itself should be fetching data from a database so it can be ha can happen quickly it can happen over and over and over again so let's take a few steps back we still have our page we still have our api but let's introduce a database and this is going to be postgres for us we're going to be using postgres database and let's say that we want the api and the database to talk to one another so that the data is exchanged between the two. So the API and the database are talking every so often and the recent weather data is saved as the most recent entry in the database. So when someone visits the page and it says, hey, give me the local weather, well, it goes to the database and the database returns your information, not the API. So your page is never communicating with the API, so it can't cause your page to blow up when the API stops working. So what we realized right off the bat is that we need a way, when someone's not visiting the page, for the database to be constantly updated with fresh weather information. Well, that's how we do what's called a worker function. And that's this blue function here. This is a separate Python script that is independent of the page itself that will go out on a timer, fetch data from the API stored in the database, and this should run on a regular interval around the clock all throughout the year. It should never stop working, okay? And let's say we set it to every 10 minutes, the API gets pulled, the logic is performed to extract the data that we want, and the data is written to our database, say once every 10 minutes. In that way, you can have thousands and thousands of viewers at the same time refreshing your page and it's served fresh information from the database, which will never get bogged down. You can have virtually unlimited users with you know cloud computing. And they will get information not real time, but you know, every like maybe it's a few minutes old, you know, maybe it's five minutes or 10 minutes old, but every 10 minutes they refresh, they get fresh data. Now, the only way to lower the threshold from 10 minutes to say every minute is to either pay your API provider for an, an increased limit or to decrease the amount of data that you're pulling. So the reason I say that is for the Weather Underground API, the current conditions is one API call. The future forecast is a second API call. Sunrise sunset is a third API call. So there might be for your weather station, if you want to get a good amount of data, let's say you might be calling three or four or even five times just to get the amount of data that you need for one page load. And so, you know, we can use our worker function to make all five API calls and write the stuff to the database, but now we're making five calls every time the worker function runs. And again, if we have a small limit, we can hit that pretty quickly. So think about, look at the docs, find out how, how many calls that you're permitted on your rate limit for your API. Think about how many calls it will take different endpoints to get the data that you need and do the math and think if I need this to run around the clock, how often can I run it and still stay under 
So 10 minutes is a good basic uh, sort of baseline. That's what we're going to use because there's some pretty cool stuff in Heroku that allows you to schedule it. And that's really simple. So think of it this way. So what we're going to do is instead of going in here and just writing all of our code right off the bat, we're going to create a worker file here. And this is where we're going to write all the logic for fetching our data from our API, storing it to the database. Now we'll have to create a Postgres database. We'll have to do all the database connections and do everything in here. And we'll run the script and we'll see that it is actually writing data into our database. And then once we have data in the database, we can start telling Django how to retrieve that and how to display it on a web page. And once everything's working, locally, we'll just point our database, our worker functions, uh, and our Django app to from our local database to a database that's hosted in Heroku. Okay, so we literally just point it from our local install to the Heroku setup, and everything should work just fine. So I'm going to pause here and break for you to get this set up, and we'll come back and we'll flesh out our worker function get our database working and make sure that we're able